Greetings to you this morning from Botswana. This video is about the handling of God's Word. As I had put together another video already about how we read God's Word, this is kind of a, a little bit deeper application, just something to look at, and it's only meant that way. Uh, I'm doing this, I thought it was a good example to show, because there are a couple passages within the, within the book. We'll be looking at the book of 1 John, and just saying that, well, I heard some misrepresentation of some different scriptures coming from the book of 1 John. And so what we need to do is we need to look at this in the context that it's given in, first of the, of the book, of the writing. It's, it's a letter. It's not even written to be a book, per se. This was John writing a letter, uh, generally, you know, to believers. It wasn't a specific group of believers. And we need to see the context that these were put in, also in the context of the entire Bible. Because, of course, I mean, we would know some things simply, such as, you know, when we hear an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, I'm going to get revenge on this person. Well, we would know that Jesus said we will not take our revenge. Our revenge. He said that you used to hear eye for eye, tooth for tooth, but now I'm telling you to, to love your enemies. I'm telling you, you know, to be quick to forgive, you know, things like that. And so we know that this has changed because we know the entirety of the Bible. Uh, you know, for example, another exa good example would be from Genesis. We know that the serpent came and beguiled the woman. Well, how do we know that that serpent was the devil? We know that serpent was the devil because it's accounted for in the book of Revelation. That's when it refers to the devil as the serpent. So you see, we need the entirety of God's word. And unfortunately, there is that tendency to just take verses, one verse, a couple verses, and just pull them out of, out of context. So this is just, this isn't so much for picking on, on the book of First John or even the things I'm going to say. It's just an example to use that you could apply elsewhere and say, hey, whoa, wait a minute. What does this verse, what does this passage actually say? Now, the book of First John has five chapters in it. It's not that long, but it is uh, moderate. And this is the verse that, that has stood out to me. This is from 1 John 5, 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that ye may know that ye have eternal life, and that ye believe on the name of the Son of God. Now, I have seen that verse used as quotes for defending the view of eternal security. Once saved, always saved, nothing can happen etc., etc. My name was written down in the book of life on this date back here, and unfortunately God can never take that out of his book, which we know biblically is not true either. Uh, but it doesn't go far enough. You know, when you're looking at this, looking at this scripture, even by itself, it doesn't really go far enough. We need to take this in context of the book. At 1 John 5.13, you know that you're near the end of the book of 1 John. You're the end of the letter. In fact, there are only eight verses beyond that. And so what happens is John is wrapping up his letter. And the first thing you see in this verse is, These things have I written unto you that believe. He's, he's writing to Christians. That's what these letters are. They're written to Christians. These things have I written unto you. What things? Those are the things we want to know. He's not talking about them in this verse. He has talked about them in the, in the chapters leading up to this. And he didn't even know they were chapters at this time. You know, this was all just a part of his letter. And so what, what things, what is he really saying here? These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. Boy, he, he says that. First he says, you know, you believe, but I'm writing these things so you'll know that you're saved so that you know that you're walking in the truth. And that's what it is. He's giving this book of 1 John as direction for how the Christian should live. You will see important issues in this. You will see the issue of repentance that we see in 1 John 1 and 2, how we must confess our sins and we will be forgiven, how we're told, no, no, we, I'm not writing these things to you so that you know that you sin, but if someone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, which is Jesus Christ. He's showing that we still have that. We are seeing the importance of keeping the commandments. 
In other words, if we're born again and we're saved, we will naturally want to keep God's commandments. They're not a grief to us. We see this several places in the book of 1 John. And I only encourage you to look at this book for yourself. What I'm trying to say is that 1 John 5.13 is a reference to the things he has written before that in the same letter. And these are some of those things. We also see that we're told not to love the world or the things in the world. We are told to test the spirits, how we can spot those that are antichrists, that are against the things we believe in. We are told to love our fellow Christian brethren and also to love with works and not just in words. We are told how we may ask and receive because we do those things that are pleasing in God's sight. It's encouragement of faith. We are told that we are the children of God by adoption. If someone just opens the Bible who is, who is not saved and they read uh, 1 John 3, 1, they may say, wow, I'm a child of God. Well, no, you're not. You're, you're a child of the devil. You're a child of wrath until, until the redemptive work comes in. So again, these, uh, these books are for Christians. We find that God loved us first by Jesus' death on the cross. We see something very important. There is a scripture, 1 John 5, 7, on the Trinity. As far as I know, it may be the only direct verse in scripture that supports the Trinity. And wouldn't you know, in most new versions, it is taken out. That's how I knew that Bibles were being altered when someone pointed out the absence of this verse in my own Bible that I was using, which was the New American Standard. Of course, now it is the King James. That's what I go in. We also know the importance of asking in God's will. Oh, I, I stand on those promises from 1 John 5, 14 and 15. If we ask anything in his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, we know that we have the petition that we have asked of him. God is going to answer those prayers. It all, there is also, though, in the book of 1 John, an accounting for sin. And here's where we get into this. Now, here, here is a, another area of scripture where we have to learn to take things in context of how it is given and also in context of the entire Bible. So I'm going to read to you. There's several verses in 1 John that mm, may be a little troubling, but I've heard people misuse them and they've misused them greatly. This one is from chapter 3, verse 9. You will find the same thing about sin in, verse, in chapter 3, verse 6, and in 518. All of, these, all of these things will be listed in the description below, including uh, links. Uh, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Well, this makes it sound like, well, a Christian cannot sin. And where, of course, we know that sometimes we will stumble, we will fall. We're not perfect. We know this inherently in ourselves, but some people say, hey, God just doesn't see it as sin. He just kind of turns his eyes like this and he doesn't see it that way. That is not at all what this says. If you read in the book of 1 John, you will know he's acknowledging sin and we must acknowledge sin and it will be put away from us. He acknowledges the fact, I believe it is in chapter 2, verse 2, where even after we know him, we may stumble into sin. But Jesus is our advocate, and he will stand in the gap for us. We will know by the ending in 1 John, we will know that there are sins. There are some sins that cannot be prayed for. And so you understand that when he's saying that, that whoever is born of God does not commit sin, and he cannot sin, what this is really talking about is deliberate, intentional sin. He cannot be living a life of perpetual sin. He cannot be jumping from, from drunkenness to fornication to lies to theft. He's not doing that. These things will be occasional stumblings. They will not be the course of his life. This is kind of a generality being used by John here. You know, he, he cannot sin. He doesn't want to sin, and he's not going to make a habit of it. And if you really want clarity on that, you should go to Romans chapter 7, Verses, verse 18 through especially verse 8, 1. It's this whole section where we see how a Christian, even a believer, will stumble with sin. So all of this is said just to encourage you uh, to keep in faith, to read the entire context of what is going on, 
and uh, not to be caught up in chapter or verse. If you're listening to those teaching you, you know, listen to them and what they're saying about a particular verse, about a particular section. See if it makes sense in the light it's given in. Many times it does not. We are supposed to search the scriptures daily to see if these things are so. I pray that God will bless you and help you to do just that.